listening to the Deep Purple Podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. Welcome to the Deep Purple Podcast, the first and only podcast devoted to one of the greatest bands in rock history, Deep Purple. Today's episode is episode number 203, Whitesnake 1987 Part 1. And coming to you from the canine suburbs of Chicago, I'm your host, Nathan Beaudry. And coming to you from the suburbs of Providence, I'm your co-host, John Tennis Elbow Matola. Oh, you've got Tennis Elbow now? Oh, you had Tennis Elbow, didn't you? No, I had Golfer's Elbow. It migrated. <laughs> it's now a multi it's, a multi-threat athlete oh man it's it's all uh, when we were when we were on the trip i was mm -hmm. fine and then i got home and it's like i'm in fucking pain every day there's no other way to say it it's like i don't know what's going on but i have to i decided i'm going to the doctor because i've tried stretching mm -hmm. i tried resting it and it's like it's obviously i'm aggravating it by doing something because when we were on vacation and i wasn't lifting a damn thing all we were doing was <laughs> drinking and walking around and going to deep purple. <laughs> it was like no problems. So obviously I'm doing something to aggravate it. I had the same thing. I think, I think we talked about this. I had the same thing like a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Just freaking whatever you call it. Tennis elbow. Just horrible. Yeah. Do and not so. recommend. So I, so I, you know, I tried two avenues. I went to the, well, I mean, when we got back from the trip, I started to get like a, like a stiffness in my neck, which, you know, happens. And it just like that and the elbow got really bad. So I went to the chiropractor and then I got massage therapy the next day. So chiropractor is really good for the neck. A lot of times they can relieve stuff in the arm too, because they will snap that back into place or whatever they do. So he's, He's like, he grabs my left arm because it's in my left arm and he's pushing down like on like the top of my forearm and he's like kind of kneading the muscles and he's like, oh, your matorsius ladidius fissimus is really tight. And I'm just like, he's like, uh, does that hurt? And I'm like, yes, stop it. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. I went to so, the so physical painful. therapist and she would like, she would press on this muscle. Does this hurt? No. Does this hurt? And then she hit the one that hurts and it's like sends you through the ceiling. Oh my God. But he was just like, yeah, this is really tight. I'm like, I know, give me my arm back. It freaking hurts, man. It was like pressing into, it. I mean, I know that it's like, you know, it's good for you, but man, get, getting those areas worked out, it was like not relaxing. So happy birthday to me. I just got a bunch of pain for my late belated present. <laughs> I mean, that seems to be the, the running theme it seems to be pain for the birthday, you know? Uh, so so tell us about tell us about your new bundle of joy. Yeah, well, I, I can't remember if we talked about it on the last episode, but yes, the dog has arrived, and we have we now have a puppy, mm. and uh, she is uh, very cute and very mm -hmm. well behaved, but it's definitely uh, also a lot, <laughs> a lot more stuff in my life now. Yeah, it's just like uh, I wasn't exactly looking for ways to fill my copious amounts of free time but now i've got uh <laughs> i've got it on lockdown which is just yep a lot of a lot of dog dog routines but you know it's it's been what we we've only had her kind of full time since friday so for like four days now uh, we so, had her over for a couple of visits before that mm -hmm. but it's going pretty well it's going probably as well as you could hope for have you chosen a name yet well the dog's name is ray like r-e-y like like Star Wars. So we've just been calling her that and we've been voting on names and not being successful. So we're like, we're just going to call her Ray Ray. Like there's just no, you know, like somebody was going to be pissed off no matter what other name we picked. So we just <laughs> figure let's just, let's just go, let's just keep her name that. And, you know, I mean, secretly, secretly you could, you could just be like, okay, Ray for Ray Fennec, but Oh, Ray. Oh, there you go. I was, I was, yeah, I was also thinking Ray Bork. So yeah, I'll take, I'll take it. That's, that's fine by me. All right. See, so secretly you kind of, we, we worked it in there somehow. Exactly. Yeah. I'll take it. Great. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but yes, yeah. So that's that's the story. That's what's going on here. So yeah, you may have. I'm this show may be interrupted, and I may have to run upstairs to uh, <laughs> if there's too much barking or whatever. But she she hasn't really been barking very much um, all right. at all. So we've been trying to train her not to bark. So hopefully, um, hopefully it's working. But you might hear something. We might have to pause the show. The kids <laughs> might come down and say ah, she pooped on the floor, and I'll be like, you figure it out. <laughs> uh, of course the you know the kids that we're going to do everything now are like okay guys mom's leaving i'm going downstairs you need to stay in this room with the dog and one of you gets ready for basketball and the other one what it's boring <laughs> <laughs> you know, i wish i could just stay in a room with a dog but i got other stuff to do so yeah they they want all the you knew it you called it they want all the good parts of the dog but well the two older sons have been very uh, they've taken a very hands-off approach and my daughter who's three seven is like done 90 percent of the work she is all <clears throat> she's like takes her outside gets lets her pee picks up her poop like wipes her paws off when she comes back in takes her back like she's feeding her she's training her she's filling her water she's doing everything and they're like we're doing like half the work <laughs> You guys, are, you guys played PlayStation for like two hours the other day while you're while you're. Uh, <laughs> now, did, did they divide that half between the two of them? So each one is actually doing twenty five well, percent of the work. <laughs> one of them said today, I "Think, well, Josie only does sixty percent of the work." I was like, "That means you two fools, you two cretins between the two, you do twenty percent each, which I think is <laughs> very generous." I'm saying she does ninety, and they split the remaining ten. And how much? How much do you throw in there? <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, so that's far. just that's the child amount of the labor. I would say I would say my daughter is doing maybe more than I'm doing. So she's good doing for a her. Really good job. Good for her. Very proud of her. Those other two knuckleheads, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but hey, if you want to support our show, there's a few ways you can do it. This the Deep Purple Podcast is hundred percent listener supported and ad free. So if you receive value from our show consider giving us some value back. And one of the ways you can do that is by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can buy some merch at our Etsy store. You could become a patron on Patreon or on PayPal for as little as $1 a month. Uh, you could also donate on Cash App, dollar sign DPPOD, or support us on Ko-fi. Uh, buy us a coffee that will not go to co well, well, we'll put the coffee money aside from Rich for our next trip. Um, but <laughs> we, um, we take all that money, put it right back into the show. Um, yeah, b believe it or not, John and I have not retired. We're not living, uh, the life of Riley here off of the Patreon money. We are just uh, using it to help support the show and make it, make it even better for, for our listeners. So, um, and you know, hopefully we're, we're still hoping that you, some, some real big, some like a Jeff Bezos type figure will swoop in and be like, Hey, I'm going to join you at the <laughs> $1 million tier. And we say, Oh, great. That would be. Bezos. That would be beautiful. We gotta find out what Bezos really likes and try to appeal to him to to become a Patreon. Like like we just I mean start a second podcast just for him. See if he'll, knowing him he'd probably come in at like the the one dollar tier. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd, he'd he'd find some loophole that have, have to be our tax write off. <laughs> oh man, that would be just our luck. Yeah, well, well, maybe there's some philanthropist out there that can support our retirement. But until then, we're going to just keep doing this the way we're doing it. And uh, speaking of the people that support our show, at the executive level, coming in at the $25 Uncommon Man tier, we have Ovis Nakvi and Purple Maniac. At the 10-pound Good Doctor tier, we have Dr. Jill Brees and Dr. Mike Catan. I like that we didn't start calling him Dr. Mike Catan until he joined. The, like he's officially <laughs> received his, the Deep Purple Podcast doctorate. It's like, like okay, a... now, now that you've upped it, we can call, we'll call you doctor. God damn yeah. it. Let's see. He wasn't a real doctor until he moved into the, <laughs> to the doctor tier, you know? Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll print up a little diploma for him. Um, at the turn it up to $11 tier, we have Clay Wambacher, Frank Tealgard, Mortensen, Allen, Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and Mickelstein. And at the $10 Someone Came tier, Ryan M., Jeff Bryce, Victor Campos, Better Call Saul Evans, um, and, uh, thank you to all of you for your generous support of the deep purple podcast. All right. You can also check out like-minded shows at deep dive podcast network.com. Uh, lots of great shows about lots of great bands. Check it out. Um, it's a great way to, uh, stay in tune with what's going on, uh, in other with other bands it's, uh, we've learned a lot about a lot of other bands from that. So, um, but before we move on, there is one thing we must do. And that is, of course, Postcards from the Edge, 
of Connecticut. Uh, this one comes to us. Um, so one of the topics on our on our concert dates uh, watching Deep Purple was my getting a new dog. So I got this this one in, which is a um, <laughs> it's a little dog jigsaw puzzle commemorating oh, the uh, love stamp. Uh, if you're an American um, or get mail from America, they have these love stamps. And this is when this must be when they raised the price to 22 cents for a stamp. And it's a little so it's it's carefully taped together so that the jigsaw pieces don't fall out. Oh, it's Very actually cool. a jigsaw. It's a real. Yeah, I don't know if you could say it's a real jigsaw. You yeah, see no, pieces that's cool. A little little mutt there it says stamp design 1986 the United States Postal Service. So uh, that must have been uh, when they raised the price to 22 cents. That's when a lot of people, 22 cents, I'm not sending any mail anymore. Every time they do that, there's people grumbling. Um, this one says, um, uh, Nate, now here's a Valentine's Day puzzle for you, Pete. So coming to us from Peter Gardeau, obviously, uh, a postcard from the 80s. Actually, it's one of the later ones he sent, and usually they're from like the 30s or the 40s. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, Valentine's Day, it was dated Valentine's Day, and that's actually the day we got the dog, so. No, that's great. There you go. Um, and it says, Puppy Love, the fifth in the love series. Puppy Love is called the most innocent of loves. The stamp was issued January 30th, 1986. So oh, that's you cool. You know, I I, I don't know. I, I still can't believe that. If you think about it, the outrage that people have expressed over raising a postage stamp. Like, you could, you're basically, like you're putting, what are postage stamps now? Like, I haven't bought one in ages. Um, well, this, <clears throat> I think I, I, it's got to be like 50. Let's let Let's see. U.S. postage stamp. Let's see what the cost is. I only ever get the forever stamps, so they never say the price. Yeah, me too. Well, I mean, I've had mine for like literally forever because I don't mail anything anymore. So, so. this says, uh, does it even say? People are yelling at us. 63 cents. Wow. All right. That's all right, so, 50. all right, 63 cents, right? I remember cents, when they raised right? it to 25 and people were like, oh, 25 cents. But I mean, still, that blows my mind, right? You just put like, right now, 63 cents, right? I could put any piece of paper in an envelope, stick that stamp on there, give it to the post, throw it in a mailbox and just be like, yeah, take that, take that to Illinois. <laughs> or Honolulu. <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. You know, or Anchorage, the, Alaska. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's crossing, it's a cross through another country to get there. Take it anyway. Take it to the West Coast. Take it to San Diego. Like, are you kidding me? I mean, no, it's a great deal. I, I think Even it's a great deal. Cents. Even the exorbitant I mean, price of sixty-three cents. I remember yeah, when they you, raised it to like twenty something, so twenty-five, thirty cents. Oh my God! It's like, dude, you're still like. <laughs> This 22 is probably up from 20 or 21 or something. Yeah. You know, it's probably not, not anything big. But hey, that's not all. There's another one. This one. This one comes from us to, from New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. It says, uh, on the back, it just says New Jersey. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> <laughs> no story. And uh, and it says right, mm. is if, you, if you see on it right here, it's circled New Brunswick. And it says, you are here. <laughs> but of course, that was done by Peter. So yeah, it says, we were there. Hey, now, now that's a fun Deep Purple show for you, Mark and Pete. So he's probably doing this in the lobby of the hotel while we, while he was getting ready to drive me to the airport. <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, that's that's great. It's commemorating our. Um, of course, did he? Well, this was on the. T I'm trying to look at the date on this one. I don't know. This might have. He might have actually bought this in New Jersey, um, but he did have a dog-related stamp uh, postcard. So thank you, Peter, for. Uh, the wonderful postcards as always. always keeping it interesting always keeping it interesting and relevant that's what we really appreciate um but hey we're not here to just talk about postage rates we're here to talk about deep purple and deep purple related items this week coming to you white snake the mo more commonly in the u.s referred to as simply white snake but mm -hmm. in europe and other places this was called 1987 or the 1987 album and um in 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 lieu of saying white snake white snake as the show title which is oh white snake 1987 even though that's not what we grew up calling it so uh this right. is a big one um kicking it off like what are your what are your thoughts and memories on this album like what what do you, what are your, what's your instant thought when you think about this album 
Oh, I mean, uh, quintessential white snake, at least at the time. I mean, um, I, I think I've made it pretty well known that I didn't know. I mean, growing up, I didn't know any other white snake except for this one, because then when this album hit, when it was big, this came out obviously in 87. So when I started to get into music, it was like 88, 89, like really get into rock music. And um, I mean, this time the album was only at that time, the album was only a couple of years removed. So, I mean, it was still huge. And anything that I knew about White Snake was any of the hits on this album, the videos, um, just the, the image. So um, that was just kind of woven in with my knowledge of who White Snake was. Um, I, I didn't get the I didn't get this album until years later. Uh, because I was first discovering uh, uh, like um, other other glam metal and and um, you know uh, like Ozzy, Motley Crue, all them, and then later on working my way backwards and kind of rejecting all that and getting into more stripped down rock like Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, the '70s stuff where there was no image. It was kind of funny how I kind of like circled around. Um, yeah. <laughs> cause I started off with like the really like hair metal guys. And then by the time I got to high school, I was just like, yeah, that stuff is crap, you know? And then I want, <laughs> like, I, like I'm into like the, the real players that like just kind of walked out on stage and were like, me, you know, they, they didn't wear outfits or anything except They're kiss like, for some reason, <laughs> except for kiss for some reason. I don't know why they were an exception, but, um, but yeah, anyways. Um, so that was my, my initial experience with this album and this music and, my um uh, my introduction to who white snake even was right yeah i mean that album cover when i see it i just think of that time and this album coming out and just i remember just just i don't know i guess i was just kind of a contrarian or kind of you know to me i just i never was i never this album just never hit me the way that it hit so many other people um mm -hmm. so i i always had this kind of um aversion to it and and and, it, and i think it's because it got lumped in to me this was white snake this was this might as well have been their debut album and i'm sure it was probably the same to you and a lot of americans because we right. just didn't get exposure to those other albums um, right, I right. Think, I think we've talked about it before. I think this was the first album that was, or, or the Slide It In was the first album that was released in the U.S. Um, uh, with the like, uh, otherwise you were getting them through imports. So I just, I, yeah, I didn't know anything, and I, I was too young when I was too young when Slide It In came out to pay attention. And three years later, when this came out, I was just kind of like, you know, to me it was the same as I, I just remember having an aversion to Bon Jovi, the Beastie Boys, White Snake, you name it, anything that was like. Uh, the hysteria album by Def Leppard, any of mm. that, I was just like, eh, it's too. Pu That's what all my <laughs> all the kids at school listen to. I'm not, I'm not a, yeah. a fan of it. Um, oh man, yeah. The... Later on, I never really came around to Bon Jovi. No offense to Bon Jovi, it just never really was my mm. thing. Um, but I pretty much came around everything else. Yeah, the same. I, I remember the the Def Leppard album was kind of lumped into that one as well because they were. It was very, um, very produced very pop very different from what their early sound was and i remember specifically being very anti-hysteria like man i don't like that stuff i like i like harder edge stuff um which upon listening back to hysteria uh just to take a quick detour uh, just kind of like some of these other albums if you're in the mood for that sound for that kind of stuff it is really good so i mean yeah um, and i i was like a I, I, in fact, earlier today when I was I was looking for something in my MP3 collection, um, you know, before I moved to New York, I just took all my CDs and I MP3'd them and then I moved to New York and I left all the CDs at my parents' house because I was moving to this tiny little apartment. I didn't any, have any space for all the stuff. Mm -hmm. I was going to bring 2,000 CDs with me. And um, I was looking through my one of my, my folders. I was looking for Deep Purple and I saw Def Leppard there and I was like, huh. I clicked on it. It was like, on through the night, high and dry, pyromania nothing else I didn't, even have, I didn't no. even have hysteria i never owned hysteria uh, you know so it was um uh, yeah just I, there was some something about that sort of thing that i always kind of pushed back against and i've definitely uh, come around in later years but yeah it's to me seeing this album is like this is my, my cousin uh, natalie who lived right across she lived right next door to me 
and later on she would move out and my cousin Jeff would move in. Uh, so I always had a cousin there, and she was the cousin there that was had the heartthrob posters all over the wrong. You know, Corey Feldman and a, probably Bon Jovi and Michael Jackson. She had all these you know posters all, and I was I just I looked at this sort of stuff as just oh this is like just appealing to girls or whatever you know like the white snake all a bunch of pretty boys. I didn't know any better. Which I mean they were trying to do with the with yeah. the image at this point, but um, absolutely. <laughs> I mean it didn't yes. hurt. I mean Coverdale never looked more quaffed up <laughs> than he oh, did yeah. at this point you know so but yeah, blonde, um blonde hair and yeah the the tank top and like the the leather pants and and i mean that, that's the one thing that it too like the, especially around this album when i saw the pictures of the group first of all the i was always so confused even before i knew who white snake was because i'm just like there's like 12 people in this picture like who is everybody it, it seemed like there were so many people because it was like the um obviously the the lineup on this album as we're going to talk about wasn't the lineup at all that was in the videos except Coverdale and I just remember seeing all of them and I saw Coverdale and I'm like oh look at him he's so old yeah <laughs> because I mean and he was like friggin' like what 35 or 36 at the time and I just thought yeah, like man yeah. he's got to be like 50 or something <laughs> he's on death's door <laughs> well be because no, I mean 40 years later we have a podcast and still he'd still be putting out music but I mean the thing is is that it's just like yeah at that time some of those guys that were in the the uh the the early mid late 70s when they were in their mid to late 30s at the time you think that a lot of those hair bands were like 10 years younger than them like motley crew rat poison they were all in their 20s so yeah 35 was a little bit older but i mean not ancient by any means but I, maybe it's just because like coverdale with the with the blonde hair for some reason it just did without even seeing him with the darker hair previously and the you know the beard and that whole look it's yeah. just like it was it was already kind of kind of weird on him you know it just it almost aged him a little bit you know when you also didn't think like everyone's hair looked like that you know all the girls at school had the same hair like it's kind of a joke now but if you look at your your, your book it's like every yeah. girl might, they might as well have just been the same girl 50 times on the page that yeah. same like that little hair thing that like shot up and like like a waterfall <laughs> like a fountain or whatever you know yeah everyone is doing that and they had the crimped hair and everyone dyed their hair blonde so it, you just didn't even bat an eyelash you're just like oh, that's what that's just what people do um but yeah i i just remember my uh, and I, and I think the other part of it too is just um like overexposure to here I go again and uh is this love to an extent um where I just was definitely at a point where I never wanted to hear either of those songs still of the again. night yeah still of the night for some reason I feel like I just didn't get as exposed to that song for whatever reason I don't know why like um yeah it it, it didn't it didn't hit me quite the same as here I go again, which was just, yeah, I mean, the, you, couldn't, you couldn't escape it. You, you know, you'd be you'd listen to the radio, you'd put on MTV, you'd go to the roller skating with your friends. It would be playing every, everywhere it was being played. Like you could I mean, not avoid it. And, and even now oh, you, yeah. you get the, you get uh, any kind of playlist or, or bar or place that is playing that era of playlists. And inevitably one of those songs is going to be thrown in there. Probably. Here I go again, the single version. Um, yeah. Even uh, before a uh, show that I saw a couple of years ago, uh, the um, the uh, the casino I went to, um, there was a afterwards there was you know one of the bars upstairs. There was like a acoustic duo in there, and I think I sent you the video too. And they were doing Here I Go Again, and I was singing along, and I was singing the hobo lyrics with it. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to show that I was an OG. So. Um, yeah, exactly. And everyone's just looking at you like, what the, why doesn't he know the words? He's not even close with the hobo. What is he, <laughs> what is he talking about? I'm like, yeah, I know the, I know the OG lyrics, man, but. <laughs> and, yeah. And everyone's like, yeah, we don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> mm. uh, but yeah, it's, um, yeah. It, so for me, I think that the, the, the challenge part, challenging part of these episodes is going to be separating myself from that initial feeling because again like we talked we've talked about this a million times on the show we discovered many years later like oh, well many few years later <laughs> that oh my god 
the guy from White Snake was in Deep Purple. I'm like, wait, White Snake had <laughs> how many albums before this album? What's going mm. on? Like, it was, you know, that's very specific to our age and um, uh, the country that we grew up in. And to right. this day, you our know, experience. If I, if I talk to anyone. You know, I remember years ago playing, it might have been like David Coverdale's solo album or something, and Jen being like, what's that? And I explained to her who it was. She's like, the, the guy from White Snake? What? This? This? <laughs> the guy from White doesn't, you know, it, you know, it got lumped in with with hair metal. It got lumped in with heavy metal. It, and, it, and it just, even the stuff we're getting into, to me, is it, it was never, Coverdale was never quite heavy metal. Maybe slip of the tongue. A little bit, but even I don't album, know. I, I would I, mean, I would argue this one was pretty yeah. pretty heavy. I mean, the um, just not even the style of uh, music, the 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 uh, guitar, the style of the guitar playing, but also the production and everything else definitely was not not your not your mama's white snake, <laughs> <laughs> not the white snake you grew up with. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Um, so yeah, a little bit of. Um, a background on the album so so just for perspective and this i find interesting slide it in was released in january of 1984 very so it was recorded in 83 re released very very early in 1984 um their last show that they played prior to white snake this album 87 being released was rock in rio in january 19th 1985 so a year later um this album was released in 87 so two full years after the final show that they played together and three years after the last album wow. and putting that into perspective david coverdale after he released after he leaves deep purple 1977 white snake 78 north winds 78 trouble 79 love hunter 80 ready and willing 81 come and get it 82 saints and sinners and 84 slide it in and saints and sinners was released in november slide it in in january so it looks like there's a two-year gap but it was really 14 months so, so he was really pumping them out yeah before that 75 uh you know 75 uh, come taste the band 75 uh stormbringer 74 burn so he's he's consistently releasing basically one album a year every year until this then there's a three-year lull so you have to take oh we didn't we didn't know about this but you you need to take into account like the the people that were following them are just what's going on with them it's all washed up it's all done yeah what's the hold up nate <laughs> what's the hold up well i'll tell you uh well there were a few issues um he ended up having this really bad sinus sir sinus condition he had to have surgery for um and as a result, he needed a really long recovery. They're saying he couldn't like speak for like six months or couldn't wow. sing for six. I don't know if that's true or if it means he could just not sing, but he had to basically be quiet for six months. And um, so I basically, I think it was like nine months or a year turnaround from having the surgery to be able to do again. So that's a part of it. Um, there's a lot, uh, there's actually a really good story um, from Ulti Ultimate Classic Rock in, 19, in a 2017 interview with David Coverdale about this he says i thought i was done i thought it was over i thought it was stick a fork in me i'm done i was very substantially in debt due to not working for two or three years and there had been a terrible advantages taken while i was in recovery from sinus surgery and unable to really function in a professional environment and people who i trusted i found out i couldn't trust so the album became extraordinarily expensive the most expensive white snake album ever and it was minimal to do with me so that was the primary reason for me in a relationship. If you can't trust your partner or partners, it's time to move on. I had flown home for a very sad Christmas holiday with my daughter in Munich, and she was kind of punishing me, understandably, because I had just left her mother. So I flew home from Munich to L.A. pretty depressed about it and very sad. So the Coverdale, the jovial Coverdale we're talking about is kind of at an all time low at this mm -hmm. point, personally, professionally, health wise. So kind of a dark time for for one of our favorite guys. Um, in Metal Hammer UK in 1987, Coverdale says, there was an illness in the studio and it took eight, um, there was an illness and in the studio it took ages. There were problems with attitudes and mentalities and some wonderful egos. It stopped being fun. I wanted to throw it down the toilet, not because of the music, but because of the problems that went with it. So all of these articles, of course, lovingly sent to us by the wonderful Jorg Planer. Um, generally, when I hit him up and I say, hey, we're going to cover an album. What do you got? 
he'll send me like a folder with you know and I'll 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 download it it'll be a folder of all scans of magazines and it will be 27 megabytes or 14 megabytes He's like, he's like, there's too much for this. So I'm just going to send you my whole 1987 folder. And it was almost a gigabyte. Oh <laughs> it was like 980, Holy shit. Me- uh, 980 um, megabytes or something. So <laughs> it was a lot of stuff. And I sorted wow. through and a lot of really fascinating stuff to, to, to read through. Um, so what else did he say? He says, during the recording, I developed a sinus infection, which was absolutely not drug related. <laughs> just like, hmm, no, <laughs> no one wondered. Although, you know, I, I believe him in the while that sounds very suspect I yeah. believe him because Coverdale was never known to be like a guy that had a problem with drugs um, he said I had a deviated septum which caused me a great deal of intense pain and made me sing off key I went to a specialist who checked me over and told me he was surprised he could even ta- that I could even talk in my condition he said I'd need <clears throat> surgery but we were already months overdue so I asked if there was anything I could do to enable me to finish the album first. He gave me a course of antibiotics, told me to take three weeks off. However, when I went back into the studio and started singing again, it had all started once more. I chucked it in. Uh, so after the surgery, he said he had to have six months of silence, hmm. uh, which added to the delays in the album. Um, uh, John Sykes had also had an issue with his tonsils, so they broke before Christmas in 1985. Um, a lot of tonsil problems in the band at that um, so anyway, um, it was right after that that Phil Lynott died, uh, and Sykes had to return to England for the funeral. So there was another delay. They were all filming uh, or filming recording in Vancouver, which was really interesting because the other, I was reading about how they were doing this in Vancouver, and then I don't know if you saw Bruce Kulick's wife passed away like yesterday or the day before. What? Um, I'm sorry, Bob Kulick's wife. Oh, geez. Okay, I was gonna be like Jesus. Yeah. So, and Bob, I guess she was a little bit older than him. she was like 82 or something. Mm. But she was a she was a well known actress. And yeah, uh, Coverdale posted something about it on Twitter about how um, uh, he had spent a lot of time with them in Vancouver at the time because they were living there and mm-hmm. how wonderful a person her and, uh, and Bob were. So it was kind of a um, kind of interesting to read. Um, so uh, so yeah. Anyway, he's doing this in Vancouver. Um, uh, then. Sykes went to Toronto and said all of his amps were broken. <laughs> There's no further explanation. I don't know what that means. Oh boy! So he just took took a crowbar to his amps. He says, <laughs> he he said uh, Coverdale said it was like a world tour of recording studios. Um, after finishing the album, Coverdale said it was only nine only nine months of recording time. A true pregnancy. Fortunately, the baby's been born with no defects, and the feedback I've been getting is quite exceptional. Um, and then they talk, he talks a little bit on the departure of Mel Galley. Coverdale says the band pressured him into letting Galley go. And, uh, he referred to the, um, or Galley referred to the remaining members as the glamour boys. I don't know what that <laughs> means, but Coverdale says, um, I loved Mel's voice and songwriting, but the only way I could keep him involved was to offer a situation where he could write together. Uh, and he was still a member of White Snake, but it was peripheral. Unfortunately, I broke his heart. I know he blames me, but it wasn't my fault. I tried to get him the gig with Bad Company, but I don't think he was fat enough. So I don't know if that... <laughs> it's a dig on Bad Company there. Um, uh, John Sutherland asked uh, David Coverdale how he's protecting his voice while touring. And David Coverdale said, lots of smoking and alcohol. I keep it coated with some type of film. <laughs> Great advice, folks, for you budding young singers out there. Oh. Um in an interview with Metal Rendezvous, when asked about the surgery, Coverdale again stated that it was not drug-related. Um, he says, not drug-related. I am not doing spoonfuls of the devil's dandruff. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good one. I've heard a lot of uh, names for cocaine, but devil's yeah. dandruff was a new one for me. Mm-hmm. So um, It's further stated in the Metal Rendezvous article that he couldn't hold a note and had no power behind his voice. So it ended up taking eight months off his career, and he didn't know if he'd ever be able to sing again. So interestingly about this album is that other than his first two uh, Glover-produced solo albums, this was his first time basically not working with Martin Birch, or not working with someone who he'd been kind of brought up with in the Deep Purple camp. So uh, it was a kind of a big departure for him. Uh, and then in Metal Rendezvous, finally, he's asked about uh, the touchy subject of sex in his writing. Coverdale responded, It's disgusting. I wanted to call the album No Muff Too Tough. But to make such a ridiculous small statement, 
just to stick it up these people's noses, you're only going to gain bullshit. So that would be, of course he would call it that. That would be a hilarious album title for the album cover, which is like such a serious looking album. Cover. <laughs> if it just said like spray painted on that granite wall, no muff too tough. <laughs> that would have been freaking brilliant. <laughs> it would have been pretty good. Maybe that would be our new name for it. <laughs> Okay, so for the core band, um, we've got on bass, Neil Murray. On drums, Ainsley Dunbar, of course, from the Ainsley Dunbar uh, Retaliation. Um, uh, guest keyboards, of course, Don Airy. Uh, guitar and vocals, John Sykes. And vocals, David Coverdale. So not a lot of surprises there. Um, the only thing that I am not 100% on is it does credit guest Guitar solo on here, I go again to Andrian Vandenberg, uh, Vandenberg, sorry, and then guest keyboards to Bill Cuomo on that track. So, mm -hmm. but all else seems to be done by that core of five uh, people, which is interesting because it's it's just the one guitarist where, where we've only ever seen really two guitarists at this point. So, you got right. more of a Deep Purple style lineup. Um, it was uh, produced by Keith Olsen and Mike Stone. Keith Olsen, and we know he did those, um, uh, what do you want to call it? Those remix, those remixes of the um, uh, uh, Come Taste the Band and Stormbringer. For some reason, they never did Burn. Uh, but he's hmm. an American producer. Um, he just passed away in 2020, unfortunately. But he's got a lot of uh, uh, great credits. Um, he's uh, earned him more than... 39 gold and 24 platinum uh, certifications from his production. So uh, everything ranging from Santana, Pat Benatar, Rick Springfield, 38 Special, Joe Wall, Starship, um, and Eddie Money, Scorpions. I mean, you name it. He's, he's done a ton of uh, great rock stuff. And then um, Mike Stone, um, uh, he's worked uh, he, he worked with Queensryche or was he in Queensryche? Um, he worked with he worked at Abbey Road in the sixties. Mm -hmm. um, he was uh, Queen. He did a bunch of stuff with Queen, like everything through like uh, News of the World. Um, what else? April Wine, Asia, White Snake. Um, I don't know what the connection is there with Queensryche, but something there. Somebody that knows more about Queensryche than me, which is almost anybody in planet Earth, will uh, will write in and tell us. And yeah, that's kind of the lineup. So it's kind of a limited lineup for a for a White Snake album, but there you have it. And uh, with that, of course, we get on to the album cover. So John, what do you think? of the White Snake album cover, which I'm trying desperately to pull up here. <laughs> Not that you haven't seen it a million times, but here you go. White Snake album cover. What do you think? Ah, uh, the White Snake album cover. The the most scandalous of all White Snake album covers. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is definitely the most uh, like everything about this album is so contrary to everything that they were doing before mm -hmm. um i i mean uh, they went from the really kind of sexually charged album covers the portraits of all the the woman with the snake and the woman riding the snake and the snake with the hoo-ha as a mouth and just all that kind of stuff and uh, they just go with this simple kind of like emblem on a uh either a cracked wall or a cracked pavement or something like that yeah, it was, um, it was like marble, like just a marble wall, like like yeah. like an old Roman ruins. Sort yeah, of thing. yeah, not not pavement. Yeah, I meant like stone or marble. Excuse me. Yeah, and then white snake etched in over it. Um, uh, the the logo over the top. Um, I I don't know if you have any information on where this concept came from or where this kind of seal idea came from, but um, I actually think it's uh it's very um a very iconic for this album. I mean, it just, it, it goes together. It's, it's simple. Um, I, I don't know why it works. Maybe it's just because everything on this album is just ingrained with the image of this cover. And that's just what makes it 
like one of the most recognizable and uh, probably iconic White Snake album covers in their in their history, at least success wise. I mean, you could argue that the uh, Love Hunter is more controversial or um, any yes. of the other. <laughs> I don't think it would be a hard argument to make. <laughs> <laughs> or or more famous, or some of the album covers are better or whatever. But this one is the most, I think, the most recognizable. Uh, the most iconic of their career, and I and I like it. I think it's I think it's very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely uh, gets. Uh, I mean, it 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 to me it sets up that things are going to be different. I think you could just tell automatically just looking at this. You've got a new logo. You've got this um, very serious non sexual sort of. Uh, representation of 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 the of the band and the and the product that you're about to get so like i i you know if, if you're used to the the white snake or love hunters sort of um uh, packaging this is clearly something different so yeah and i mean um and, and i mean at this point too you think it would have made more sense based on the the time that it was made in the content that the band has made the era that they're lumped in with that there would have been uh like a picture of tawny katane on the front with her hair teased up and a mini skirt she, yes. like with her boobs <laughs> popping out or something like something just really like overly sexual that really personified the era but instead they went completely in the other direction which is uh i don't know it just it, it seemed to make it even more mysterious i guess you could say and um, the guy who designed this was Hugh Syme, um, who did a lot of album covers, but um, did the Rush, uh, quite a few Rush album covers, including the 2112, you know, the Pentagram. So, like, another very, very iconic album cover. So this is a guy that, and I feel like we brought him up on a recent episode uh, uh, for an album cover, and I can't remember if it was, like, a Gillen album cover or what it was, but... I should probably be looking at that in the, in the background here, but um, I feel like we talked about him somewhat recently, or maybe it was perpendicular, <laughs> which would be very recent. Um, but I know I know he was involved with something that we've we've covered fairly recently, um, and he did he did slip of the tongue as well, which is not wildly different than that. It looks almost like the same album cover. Mm. Um, but yeah, he's uh you know he's worked with lots and lots and lots of bands, and uh, you know this is we talk a lot about some of those um oh i i think that was one of the ones that jumped out at me he did um megadeth countdown to extinction ah uh, which is kind of fun he did kiss revenge apparently um, you know what that that kind of makes sense because it's a very similar style album cover with the with kind of like this this uh this chrome looking background and like the the logo and like revenge like in splattered red it's all it's almost like the same kind of theme so um yeah, that would, that makes sense that it's um, kind of in his style. Yep, um, Coverdale Page, Aerosmith, Get a Grip, mm -hmm. um, Megadeth, Youth, Euthanasia. So uh, he did a few Iron Maiden. He did Queensrÿche. Uh, so yeah, he's uh, he's got a pretty lengthy catalog of of some pretty big heavy hitting albums and and iconic album covers. So uh, pretty great stuff. And then, of course, it's got the Latin in there, Serpens Albus. You know, um, so that's kind of get that like ancient sort of ancient Rome sort of feel to it. Yeah. Um, this is the CD as it would have appeared in. Um, uh, this is the Holland release. And you'll see the, the, the so that, of course, it's a White Snake album. So nothing's easy and everything's going to be like, oh, the U.S. version had these tracks and the U European, the original, original European release had nine tracks and the original U.S. release had nine tracks. But the tracks were different. It wasn't all the same tracks. And then there was followed up with a, another release right after that that had the two additional tracks on it. So what ends up happening is Here I Go Again is not on the U.K. European release. Um, I think, uh, I don't, I didn't read anything about it, but my thought is they probably said, oh shit, this is a huge hit. We got to re-release this immediately <laughs> <Yeah>. and include <clears throat> and tack on that. And while we're at it, we'll tack on another song because it's a CD. We can do whatever we want. So they, they tack this on really quick 
And so yeah, the, if you're out there and you have an original European or UK release, you probably have the nine tracks and it's missing that one. Um, mm-hmm. Because again, you know, we talk about him revitalizing these so- songs or doing them again for the US audiences. They wouldn't have heard most, the majority, vast majority in the US would not have heard Here I Go Again before this album was released. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is up there at the top, it says DDD, which means this is like a strictly digital recording, which I find really interesting. So like, you know, you used to see ADD or, or DAA or AAD. So that means the first letter signifies how they recorded it. So this, in this case, it was recorded digitally and it would have been digital tape at that point. Mm. Um, mm. The second letter is what they used to mix it. And again, this was digital. And then the third letter it, is the mastering process, which is again digital. And for 1987, I feel like that was probably not the norm. Usually mm. with a lot of the releases you'd get would be like, you know, would be ADA or AAD. You know, there'd just be one. You know, obviously it has to, almost always has to be digitally mastered at some point. But mm-hmm. um, in the the CD itself is, of course, digital, but um, I thought it was interesting for a release that early to be strictly digital. Um, then you've got, this is the White Snake 87. This is the European version again with the 11 tracks. Um, and again, here it is. It's got um, David Coverdale, John Sykes, Neil Murray, Ainsley Dunbar. They don't really give Airy the credits there because at this point it was still that kind of four piece. And I was reading something where they were, they were calling White Snake the uh, Europe's answer to Van Halen or something. Um, they were trying to kind of go with that angle. Yeah. Um, you know, produced by Mike Stone and Keith Olsen. Um, and then it's because writing credits down at the bottom. You've got, um, you know, pretty bland looking lyrics sheet here. Nothing too mm-hmm. crazy. Um, and then this would be the U.S. version, which starts with Crying in the Rain. Um, and I think for the purposes of our background and how this album kind of really blew up we're gonna usually we almost always go with the uk original release but since this was released actually earlier in the u.s yeah we're gonna go with the u.s version that we would have heard in 1987 all right there you go all right so um yeah before we uh before we move on i think this is a great time to pause and thank our core level patrons coming in at the seven dollar 77 cent keep it warm rat tier we have michael vader and richard fusey at the six dollar 99 cent new nice price tier fielding fowler at the episode six dollar 66 cent tier steve coldwell arthur smith and anton glaving at the six dollar 65 cent almost evil tier kenny wymore at the five dollar 99 cent the nice price tier robert smith peter from illinois michael bagford and carl helberg and at the 60 swedish kroner tier sorry Zwapper the Electric Alchemist. And, of course, the $5 Money Lender tier. John Convery, German Heindel, Adrian Hernandez, Jesper Elman, Oleksii the Perfect Stranger Slepikoff, James North, Mark Hodgetts, Will Porter, Kev Roberts, Percival Frequency, Scott Zerns, and Cynthia Doobie. Thank you so much to all of you for your generous support of the Deep Purple Podcast. Whew. All right, John. This is the moment. I never really thought we'd ever get to actually this mm. album. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm excited about it because um um post post 87 when I kind of came full circle um was into was into kind of glam and hair metal and then kind of wanted more stripped down rock music and then kind of came back to it. When I came back to this album I was like, wow. It blew me away because it's like in that genre in that time of music, it was everything that I wanted. And I was just like, man, this is like, this is heavier and bigger sounding than I remembered um, or that I would have thought. I I don't know that I knew all the songs, um, but um, it probably was like eh, maybe five to 10 years after it came out. um, Ish. Back to it. So um, with that, before we start reviewing, I'll say uh, when we're getting into this new Coverdale album, I celebrate with a glass of wine, darlings. Oh my God, John's drinking on the show. It's little... only my second or third time, darling. <laughs> it's, it's only my 203rd time. 
Well, I no, just thought it was true. like I'm I'm thinking like this is a very uh, have a have a glass of uh, have a glass of red wine. Raise your raise your glasses, darlings. Uh, uh, I'm gonna do my my cheers, Nathan, darling. <laughs> I will. Oh man, I feel. I should have. I should have had red wine. Well, next week maybe I'll have to bring Donna Ball. Yeah. Well, I had had a bottle open anyways, and I was uh, kind of coming in here with it. And I'm like, you know, this feels like a feels like a red blend kind of night to uh, listen to the '87 album. Why not? I loved when we when we got to see Don Airy um, last week. How he just both nights he just walks in with a glass of red. I just love <laughs> he's drinking red wine after the show. It's just and he drank during the show when when they did that little gimmick thing. Was there was there was one thing that I thought was that was kind of funny, and I don't know. I don't think you guys saw it, and I don't think anybody caught it. But I don't. I think I think I want to say Don Airy was holding the bottle of wine. He was like pouring in like some glasses like so there were some people standing around like two or three people mm -hmm. and he was kind of pouring some in and then when he was finished i stepped over and i leaned down i went what is that? <laughs> like for a split second to be like yeah put some in here and it was just like ha -ha, like for a split second because i figured like yeah i'll just clown around and see if it goes over and or i could get kicked out and it was uh <laughs> he'd be like security i have this man escorted out <laughs> But it it went over. He was just like, "Ah, you okay? Oh, you you little rap scallion." <laughs> but yeah, oh. so that was uh. And the funny thing is, is there were these two guys there that were probably I don't know I don't know if you remember seeing them. They were like half our age, mm -hmm. and I oh, and yeah, just yeah. like I was like, who are these guys? Are like, and just like the night dad. before, there was there was like cake or something in the next room, and so everybody was like mingling around. And toward the end, I saw these two kids walking out. And they're just like, "Oh, this is pretty good cake." <laughs> <laughs> it was just such a weird thing to see backstage oh yeah because it was in that room on the side right yeah because the first night there was a big cheese a giant cheesecake right front and center that was like with these slices that were like like a pound each and you yeah, were eyeballing these... it because it was your birthday and you still hadn't any cake yet and you just kept you were like <laughs> you were like talking to don area roger and and just kept uh-huh uh -huh, and just like looking over at that it was cake. like one eyeball was here and the other one was over here on the cake. You, want, you wanted that cake and then the second night there was a different cake and they, i guess they always just have cake backstage that's living the life man but it was just it was so funny because you think of going to like a like a rock show and you go backstage and you got people signing stuff you got people drinking wine and all of a sudden you just see a couple of like 20 25 year old dudes coming out like eating like birthday <laughs> cake and you're like the f what's going I remember on? being like wow these are young guys we should we should turn them onto the show dude There's next time thing. yeah next time we'll have to get them next time rich is like oh you should have been business cards and all this stuff i was like yeah, I probably should have, huh? <laughs> That's good. Well, idea. you know what, Nate? This is this is my pledge to you and to the audience. You you do all that. You do all that stuff. I'll handle the business cards. You do all. You do everything else. So I'll I'll handle the, the promotions. I have the QR code. I, you know, the funny. I had made business cards. I went to when when I thought I was going backstage to see Deep Purple. And yeah. I never got to go the first. Oh show. yeah. Um, I went to there was a uh, office Max or Depot or whatever it is now. Uh, right next to my work so i went on my lunch and i i paid like nine bucks and i had just, just a tiny amount of these cards made and i figured i could hand them out i had my number on it and yeah links about the show and then yeah never never got backstage so I never used them but yeah it wouldn't be a bad thing to if we're going to just print up 100 cards or something and just you know like like rich said just put them on the put them in the bathroom put them wherever and Maybe and also, like, give them to people when we're talking, because we talked to, like, a handful of people that we were just like, yeah, we have a podcast. And, like, of, of course, nobody knew. And they're just like, oh, really? I didn't know that existed. Yeah. Well, like, of course you didn't, because we're even a couple Don, of knuckleheads. Even he was on the, he was, he was not, no, I'm just kidding. He, he was no. very kind and said he remembered. I, hopefully that's true. But <laughs> I, I would like to I would like to labor under the delusion that he remembered us. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, you guys. Like, I don't know these guys. Um. Okay, I could give him a link to the episode just so he knew. here's a video of you talking to us for <laughs> proof. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so here we go. Um, we're ready to dig into mm -hmm. this album. We're going to do the U.S. version. Uh, I am very, very religious about, like, the running orders and stuff, and I hate when people mess around with them. So for our U.K. listeners who are not used to this running order, I'm sorry. But uh, this is this is the way that we... Um, kicked it off, and that is with Crying in the Rain. Oh, I think that the higher volume was a little better for me.
much different from the original. Yeah, right? It's like, it's in a totally different universe. And I actually like the way this one starts better. It's it's much more powerful opening. Oh yeah, it's totally kick ass. Yeah, I mean, I can see how you could listen to that guitar thing. You could associate this with heavy metal. Well, yeah, because he's doing, like, the pinch harmonics. And I mean, I'd like to think, too, that um, he'd written the song, like, a few years, several years before, so he was a little more comfortable with it. So by the time they got to this version, it sounded a little less stiff than the original. Even though I love the original. I love those pinch harmonics. That's great. Yeah. And I mean, you can't tell by his voice that Coverdale was going through any vocal issues or had surgery or anything. And he's singing even better than he has before. At least his, his register was like some parts of this album higher than it ever was. It's easy to see how the diehard White Snake fan might not appreciate the direction that all of a sudden this band is going into. Yeah. Drastically different than everything from before. He's just, he has this really interesting tone to his guitar. He's like a shredder, but it's not as piercing. You know, he has this really kind of like warm tone to his guitar that I really enjoy. Yeah, it doesn't sound as effective as some other Yeah. Ones. This part here going out of the solo, I always thought was nuts. Just the drums going crazy. I mean, this is when I was like, okay, like White Snake has gone metal. <laughs> territory as far as singing nope. goes on this album but that seems I can think of one a couple of other times that he threw that in over the years but it kind of becomes his go-to sort of thing and I don't know if the sinus thing had anything to do with it I mean we know that he he hit those those highs when he was in Deep purple and even when he was screaming on stage yeah but so I not mean, a, I don't know if maybe it was a um He'd had that range before. I 
I don't know. If... Hear all those delays kicking off after. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't know if like if if there was something about that recovering from that surgery that opened up his range a little bit more, made that more of a comfortable area, or if it was more of producers being like, "No, this is the style now. You've got to go for these notes." Whereas maybe Birch or who, well, whoever might have been involved would have said not to do that. You know what I mean? Again, I don't know if his voice was affected by the surgery, but it reminds me of like Frank Zappa when he, you know, he has that super, super low voice, but it was a, was a result of like he got his larynx like crushed at a concert. something, And that's why he's got that super low voice and he can sing yeah. these super low notes. So I like, I don't know if, if through some something with the surgery that if that affected him or if it was just trying to keep up with the times and the scream the screaming of the era but at any rate john how would you rank crying in the rain oh boy this is uh this is a really uh, ah, there we go fumbling with the spreadsheet this is a really um this is a really great version um i give it a uh I, i'm gonna give it a 4.5 all right. Um, and it doesn't seem to be taking here on the spreadsheet. Come on, man. Let's do it. It doesn't want to work with you. Oh, now you're giving it all sorts of weird decimals. <laughs> all right. Hang on. I mean, here, you do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be in right now for me to tell everybody. Um, yeah, 4.5. Um, yeah, right out of the gate, uh, this is a great opener for the album. And, um, and listening to it again, even though the, um, I mean, I, I could be tempted to say that the production is very timely, which it is. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of reverb and a lot of echo on things, but it's like, I mean, Coverdale still has that, that classic Coverdale voice. He's singing great. He's hitting those high notes, not going too, too crazy. I mean, he's still doing what he does. It doesn't sound like he's lost anything from his you know previous efforts. Nope. And particularly the way the drums are recorded, if you hear that kind of like that breakdown where they, they have like the, uh, the drum fills in after the solo and everything, you really, I think they were recorded really well because you really hear the room reverb on the drums. It doesn't sound to me overproduced or, or fake or like the, uh, a lot of the drum sounds that they were trying to get at the time. It actually sounded pretty organic for the time, even though it was very over the top. There were a lot of fills. I don't know if there was some double bass in there. Um, and then, I mean, Sykes playing, I think is great. I think what he adds to the, to the, uh, to the song, is is really good because he adds a heaviness to it but i don't think he's really a flashy too flashy of a shred player uh like um uh, lumping him in with uh, guys that just kind of were playing a million notes a minute because his his tone was was like i said kind of very um very warm and almost sounded like um he was using like um like a like a neck pickup or a passive pickup or something like that because it wasn't very like uh a biting tone. It's just a very like kind of a warm tone and his, his rhythm guitars are just really heavy and the way he hits those pinch harmonics or when he slides down on a note is just so heavy. Um, and, and like big, like the, this whole song just sounds really, the sound of it is just very like big, like you feel like they recorded in like an airplane hanger or something. Um, so, um, I enjoy this first entry into the new white snake sound. Yeah, I think Very big much. is going to be the um, the word we keep coming back to on this because it's mm. just a big sounding album. So, um, in Metal Hammer magazine, uh, there's an "In His Own Words" article where they ask David Coverdale about the songs. He gives these little brief rundowns. I always love when I can find these uh, to find you know some direct quotes from the people involved. So. Coverdale says, Crying in the Rain is very important to me. It was very important to get the statement across as it should have been in the first place. A lot of my colleagues had their heads securely up their arses, but a percentage of that was my fault, and I've always wanted a better recorded statement than that. I think we, we've we achieved it on this. It features a stunning solo from John Sykes. So, agree I agree on that. Um, I will give this one a four as a being a solid opener for the album um i kind of i feel like i'm more lean towards the uk running 
order, which would have been still of the night to open it up. I mean, cause that, that's a statement and a half to open the album with that. Um, however, uh, hmm. that that's where those two differ. But one area where the two, um, track listings stay the same is in the second track on the album. And that is on both versions, bad boys. I love this riff. It sounds very Zep. Well, like this, I could hear this. This sounds like a Miracle Man from the, the rest of the record. Maybe it was lifted from this. I love how Coverdale just went. Ow! 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 Yeah, but a pretty good. You're right. A pretty good drum sound for the time. Not too overly processed. Little hi hat head, you know. I don't know. I, I like it. I mean, Sykes playing in this is insane. I mean, the the rhythm of the song is great, and I mean, the fills that he just throws in are like uh, are awesome. Reminds me of our Coverdale page episode where Scott was like, I don't like songs that are about the boys. I always think about that. I was like, I wonder how he feels about this song. <laughs> High heeled women full of champagne and lies. I have, that's a great line. I love the, the, the melody guitars underneath that he puts in. Or the very melodic. Very Randy Rhodes. That first part of Tola. I love the rhythm guitar under this. It's just like pulsating along with those drums. Now all I can hear is friggin' hi-hat. Thanks a lot, Nate. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. I could go on either. It's very melodic. Dunbar kills it on this album. Yeah. Just another amazing player and name in the White Snake catalog that sort of comes and goes in the blink of an eye. Before he's even in the band, he's gone. <laughs> like I wonder it never what, happened. I wonder what this would have sounded like if old Cement Wrists was on this album. <laughs> 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 Who called him that rich? Of course. <laughs> he's not, let's just say he's not sold on Tommy Aldridge's playing. <laughs> I think of Ainsley Dunbar comes from that, like, from like the 60s and 70s. I mean, Listen how heavy his drumming he's is. So I mean, he's playing so aggressively on this. Yeah, you know, I think that that's really, that's really a good word for what we've heard so far. Is is like this is just really aggressive. Big and aggressive. Yeah. Each song we're gonna have a new word. First one's big. Now it's aggressive. We'll see what yeah. the next track runs. But but yeah, it's. Again, Dunbar, it's like it's like it's like if they had like, I don't know, Ringo or Charlie Watts or something on the album playing like this, you'd be like, Where did this come from? <laughs> I mean not that I mean Ainsley Dunbar is an amazing drummer and he's always known for it, and it's not like necessarily the um technical aspect. Maybe it's just that I'm ignorant about Ainsley Dunbar, which I certainly am, but I you know, I know him, you know, I just know 
some of his background and from it's, I know Ainsley Bun Dun uh, Ainsley Dunbar retaliation. Easy for me to say. Um, like I know some of that stuff. I've listened to it, and to me, it's just more. It's like you know, real good, you know, bluesy sort of rock band. And maybe it's just because I lost touch with them from whatever 1969 to 1987. Yeah. Uh, but just to me, it's it's pretty wild. But yeah. Again, probably stemming from my own ignorance. Um, what do you rank bad boys? Well, I gotta say this this song is like a never never a skip for me. So this is a five. Oh my god. I should have taken a mouthful of water and done a spit take. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a monocle in, you would have been Oh dear. <laughs> my, my top hat would have just leapt up and spun around and fell back on my head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if some if there was a fainting couch behind you, you would have fainted on it. I An armoire. Say, my good man, <laughs> a five. Oh, well, I mean, come on, it's not that out there. I mean, this no, song not is for you. Not for this you. this song is killer. This is what I love in a in a metal song. It's uh, it's got a great riff, a great hook, a lot of hi hat. Um, <laughs> no, that's actually <laughs> it. Doesn't bother me. I think it really drives the song along because it's just it kind of it kind of keeps it it keeps it tight. You know what I mean? And it's, um, I mean, um, the, the lyrics are just, you know, good old, good old Coverdale singing about the, the boys on the prowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm texting Scott right now to see, to see what he thinks of the song. I'll get back more on that later. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, this is uh this is a great track. Like I say, I always look forward to it. I never skip it. Um, it's just like, a, I, I think it's a, an awesome um uh part of the white snake catalog i i look forward to this song every time it comes on i think uh coverdale sings great uh during it all the playing is great um yeah when i when i'm in the mood for this this is like 100 percent what i want it is in and out too it's like it it see it, it's a four minute song it seems like a three minute song it's just it's just an all-out onslaught so in metal hammer uk david coverdale says it's a rock and roller. It's a rebel song. White Snake albums are always structured in a similar way. Musically, tempos or whatever the songs are always related. Bad Boys is the would I lie to you vein. It was is in the would I lie to you vein. And there's still a bit of rebel there. Even at 35. <laughs> even at the decrepit old age of 35. <laughs> oh my god. I hope somebody had a, a, a walker or a cane for him ready. Oh my god. Just I called the AARP. Coverdale <laughs> just turned 35 back then. <laughs> Holy shit. He's going to start getting the mailers in the mail. Oh my god. Uh, oh oh yeah. I have to rate it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give it again a four. I think it's just a you know, solid. Again, I, I'm, I'm you know if you'd asked. It's funny if you'd asked me about this down 10 years ago i would have been like eh, wait sneak album man i would have you know just kind of written it off but <laughs> zero <laughs> I, I think there's something to be said about having spent the last four years doing what we're doing and painstakingly going through every song on every single white snake album until yep. this point it's one thing to listen to the albums here and there sporadically but to 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 scrutinize them on every level and see what brought them to this point and what was going on at this point. Right. I feel like I'm in a place where I could analyze it a little bit more uh, I don't know, honestly or or fairly. Well, rather than I, just I, saying, Oh, it's not White Snake anymore. I don't like well, the early stuff. <laughs> well, I think that that's part of our our development since we started the show too. Um at least I could speak for myself, is is um coming to some of these later albums the the history of uh, like us talking about it um having listeners chime in and tell us their experiences or knowledge about it and then just us working our way up to this this point it's given me a lot of um like a lot of clarity on listening to some stuff and some stuff i i've heard and i'm like yeah i still don't like it and other things like yeah like yeah. this um obviously i'm listening to it with a uh, with fresh ears, even though I've always liked it, or even our last review perpendicular, which I hadn't really listened to in years is like in regular rotation. Now it's, it's like, mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with it now. And I'm it, also so pissed at myself for ignoring it for the past, <laughs> like X amount of years. So it's just so easy to write things off or to, or to parrot the lines that other people say, Oh, come taste the band is not really a deep purple album and blah, blah, blah. Like all these things that people just say again and again and again, without actually mm. taking the time to stop and listen and make your own opinions. And it's like, you know, you can, it doesn't mean you have to like it or not like it, but 
I, I feel like a lot more comfortable in listening to things now and saying, mm. and taking it for what it is instead of being caught up in, in 1987 and saying, oh, I don't like that. Cause all the kids listen to it. And, oh. you know, maybe there's a reason all the, maybe there's a reason this is their best selling album when eight times platinum and all this, it's, it's, it might not be uh, my go-to in rotation, but, um, there's clearly some very, um, there's clearly some redeeming value of this album more than some redeeming value. That sounds derogatory. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great album for a reason. Well, exactly. So. Right. I mean, when you, when you talk about, or when we talk about albums like this or songs like the next one that's coming up that you could say are overplayed, overhyped, whatever, when you go right back to the beginning, there's a reason that the album, the song, whatever is like, a uh, platinum however many times over was played how on on mtv or the radio how many times over it's a classic at this point or people regard it to be part of the the playlist it's because it's it's good at its core mm -hmm. so and speaking of overplayed we got two in a row for you <laughs> oh hey oh starting with the this one so i guess on the um this would have be give me all your love on the uh uk version um but on the US version, it is the opener from the UK version, Still of the Night. Love how we slid into that opening chord. String rate. Amazing riff, but yeah. you can you can see where fairly no <laughs> you have to say it. don't it has to be mentioned no like okay let's not even talk about what what you're thinking about but <laughs> you cannot listen to the song and say this is not like a Led Zeppelin song like just listen uh. to the riff listen to it. I mean, it's not. It's 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 original, but it's. But I think you pair that to with what he's doing vocally, and that's why we get the the, the genesis of the uh, rubber band mm -hmm. comparison. Oh yeah. And you can't I can't I can't hear this without just seeing the silhouette of him in the microphone. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. It's embedded into my brain. Mm. And this is when they you know, where they become this huge in this next two songs, huge video sensation. With no with no small part thanks to his new girlfriend. Right. Come on, even this, the hi-hat? Come on, John. <laughs> it's so, it's so Zeppelin. I'm going to invoke the Richie, and I refuse to acknowledge it. <laughs> All right, maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> maybe a little bit. <laughs> Shut up. But this is a long song. I mean, I'm obviously the one they're playing on MTV was not all those seven minutes. Right? So there was no, yeah, the they they cut that they cut that shit down. They cut this whole part out, didn't they? Or they, I think they really edited it down. I can't. I can't. have to watch it. almost like and a lot of people compare this to Zeppelin I would almost compare this to Pink Floyd other than what he's doing vocally just this long like interlude of like little, little musical flourishes here and there you know just a... yeah. so this part was definitely in the video yeah I mean I like stuff like this because we were talking about how uh, talking about dynamics in a song I mean this definitely 
had it. It was definitely setting a mood. It was definitely dynamic. It wasn't just a one note thing. I think they definitely did something creative with this song. And it was ballsy to release it as a single. Yeah. If you think about it. This has got to be Don Airy on a synth, right? This is not like a guy in a cello. <laughs> no. It's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's, reasonably sure it's got to be Don. If it isn't, it's, it's not a cello. It's a good, it's a good, it's a good synth sound. It sounds very realistic. Update from Scott. Stand by, he says. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll uh, update you on that later. The guitar is, like, sits a little lower in the mix than you'd expect. Wow, that was great. That last note he held off the solo. Yeah. He knows how to bend it. Oof. I guess no, but yeah, don't quote me on that. That's what I'm leaning towards. Retirement. How the hell old is he? Was he an old man of 35? No, he would have been like 41. Oh, wow. Poor guy. Probably had an oxygen tank. And... <laughs> <laughs> how could you? How could you even? How could you even live at that age? How could you even fathom it? Um, hang on. Okay, just just um, update from Scott. <laughs> he says, cool riff, but you know how I feel about those lyrical tropes. Bad boys, wild city streets. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what I was expecting. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, still of the night. All right, wait a minute. Still of the night. Still of the night. Um, what are you looking up? <laughs> Ainsley Dunbar? Oh yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. You know what? You were right. He was, um, he was, he was, uh, he was in his uh, early forties at the time, forty, early. forty-one. So I mean, that's not a... hard to believe, though. I mean, there are players now that are ten <laughs> years older than that or more <laughs> well, that play. Scott, who Scott, who I'm texting, would probably pay good money to be in his early forties, and he's in a band touring the country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right exactly. Now, so he yeah. was sadly when we were in New Jersey, he was here in Chicago playing, so I didn't get a chance to see him. Go, oh. um, but. What are you going to do? Um, all right. So what do you think of Still of the Night? <laughs> Nothing at all. I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> Still of the Night. <laughs> Nothing at all. Stupid, sexy Flanders. Stupid, sexy White Snake. Um, <laughs> Stupid, sexy Tawny. <laughs> yeah, this video. The, the only thing I remember at the end was when she, like, hopped over the car and was, like, he was driving the car and she hopped over the passenger seat and they were like, they were tongue kissing and you saw like the tongues going like, Ugh, and I was like, Oh shit. Like, I can't believe Wasn't they could here? show that. Wasn't that here I go again? I don't know. It was, it was one of, I don't know. I, thought I remember it was... yeah, as a kid, I remember like, like seeing it like, like the, yeah, the tongues are in. Well, because you know, you November used to rain that there was so much tongue in a video. You're like, Whoa. well, because you used to, 
<laughs> used to see like kissing scenes like on uh, TV or movies yeah. or like uh, Skinamax or HBO <laughs> or whatever. And it would just be this fake like, you know, mouth like think... kissing, like like guppy kissing. like Yeah, like there's that. nothing fake about that. There's probably cutting room floor stuff that cannot be aired. No, I, yeah, I remember, like you remember that that scene in um in Top Secret where they kiss and then they both like <laughs> go like this like, <laughs> with their tongues on their cheeks. <laughs> That's such a great movie. Uh, There's so many great gags in that movie. Um, okay, still of the night. <clears throat> you know, back on track here. All right, so oh, man, I'm trying to. You know, I'm I'm kind of debating this, but you know what? I'm it might be a hot take. I don't know. I might get some shit for it, but I'm gonna give it a five. Oh my goodness! After after all this time, I hear it and I still I, I'm not sick of it. And I mean, it, it's just it's such a good song. Um, it's uh, just the dynamics in it, be it the verse that that middle part, uh, the 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 breakdown. Um, it, it's just, it's so good because the song has room to breathe. So, I mean, you yeah. can appreciate, um, uh, when, when, uh, when Sykes go, does those guitar slides and when he plays that, like just immensely heavy riff, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. man, so you hear that and you're just like, oh, it's so heavy. And, um, uh, uh, Coverdale's singing is fantastic. Um, and just the, the dynamics of the song. I mean, the fact that, um, you know, he he came up with this that he wrote this after X amount of albums just shows what uh, kind of next level he was on at this point. Yep. 100%. I mean, uh, Zeppelin comparisons aside or not, I mean, he still yeah, he still composed a song that was almost what, seven minutes long. You know, all these great dynamics and riffs in it with, uh, you know, obviously with another songwriter. But I mean. Uh, well, the thing about the Zeppelin thing that kind of amuses me is like the really the comparisons don't start until here, like this album. And but it's like he had this huge career before this point. So it's like I don't the thing I think that we've always railed against is people basically writing because in America, again, this is people's first exposure. Like, oh, this guy's a Robert Plant wannabe, blah, 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 which I can get. But if you really do your research, you realize he's built this huge career. He's amazing songwriter, all these great albums. And really there there, you can't draw any comparisons until this late stage in his career when he's been 15 years active or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's clearly, he wasn't like just trying to be some sort of Robert Plant analog or trying to rip off Led Zeppelin. And honestly, music wise, I think this is the only song where I would say, okay, I get it with the Led Zeppelin. Like it's, it's reminiscent of Led Zeppelin. Um, I mean, a lot of bands around this time were doing that. I think the biggest uh, comparison maybe around this time or a year later was uh, that band kingdom come mm -hmm. um, was, was also like one of the earliest or first kind of um, comparisons of that whole, like, um, uh, Zeppelin clones, uh, uh, ten years later type of thing. Um, and uh, regardless uh, if it if it does sound uh, Zeppelin inspired or whatnot, it doesn't take away the fact that um, it's it's a well written song. It's 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 well performed and it's it's done. Uh, it's it's legendary at this point. Yep. Um, so just the latest from Scott. He says it's better than <laughs> Bad Boys. It's better than the Coverdale Page song. The boys are feeling hot tonight, he said. <laughs> so he said he'll be tuning in soon as always. So he's looking forward to the episode. Cool. Um, okay. So still of the night, uh, David Coverdale says in Metal Hammer UK, it's a love hunter song. It's a predator song. It's a relative of slow and easy victim in love and love hunter. It's kind of a night times the right time kind of song. You can get away with much more in the dark. I think it's definitive Coverdale. It's already proven to be excellent live and the band are playing it fucking great. Mm. It was uh, it was in essence arranged to walk straight off the disc into the concert hall and just expand a little on the atmosphere piece. I'm very pleased with it. It certainly gained more mileage than I could ever have wished for. Mm. Okay. That's what that. do you rate it? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you rate it? Damn it. Hmm, I guess I will give that. I'm going to give it a 4.5. Ooh. I mean, I've always really, really dug the, the, the lick are the riff and uh think it's a good song because i think while you're getting this it's clearly got some flashy 80s production it's very americanized 
But like we said before, it's not too over the top. The drums don't sound terrible like so many drums did at this time. And um, you still got dynamics. You've got that that cool part in the beginning, when, or in the middle rather, when he's doing the like little hi hat thing, and you're getting these little flourishes, and that's that's stuff's really interesting. I'm I'm glad they didn't just gloss over that to just make it be, you know, balls to the wall for the full six and a half minutes. Right. That would, that would just you know be fatiguing. Um, with that, um, it's on to the final track we'll review on this episode and to close out the first side of the LP. Uh, a track that really needs very little, if no, inter- uh, introduction at all. And it's uh, the song that you've heard a million times, Here I Go Again. I forget, is this done? It says this is Bill Cuomo. Oh, okay. I don't know where I'm going. And I'm sorry, I love that intro. Like, but I should. It sounds great. It's very it, of its time. It Usually does. those things bother me, but it sounds so good. And his voice just sounds so good on this. I think the other part of it, too, is, is that we're not just talking about some flash in the pan or some schlub. We're talking about David Coverdale on vocals right. here. So, it's got all those all those great hallmarks of a Coverdale vocal delivery. And I mean, this could have been on one of his first two solo albums. Oh, easily. Yep. I mean, he did this kind of stuff back then. So, so listen what the band kicks in here. So one of the things that struck me about the 82 version is when the band kicks in, it sounds so weak in comparison. Yeah. <laughs> and as much as I love that version, like to me growing up on this one, I just like when it kicks in, it's like, oh, what happened? Well, I mean, plus the the obvious uh, switching of the word uh, hobo to drifter uh, helps it a hell of a lot. It's not the worst move that's ever been made. <laughs> I just feel like these re-recorded versions, these 87 versions, just flow a lot more easier. They don't sound as, they don't sound as stiff. They sound more powerful, and that's with much love to the original versions too. Oh yeah. But I don't know what it would be like if I had heard, if I had spent five years religiously listening to the 82 version, how I would. I can't. There's no way for me to know how I would feel about this version hearing that one. Well, we can. All we can do is know what other people hear, what their experiences were. So, and I think a lot of their experiences are. We feel like he's become Americanized. (laughs) He's just cashing in, or whatever you want to say about it. Good solo. It's very short. But well played, of course. But I mean, that's something that I noticed so far on all the solos, whether it was this one or Sykes's uh, Sykes solos, is that, like, like I said before, they're not they're not buried in all of this like flange and delay and uh, uh, reverb and uh, whatever else was like on. Uh, even though I love that <laughs> on you know a lot of the '80s solos, but this sounded more kind of straight ahead almost like he plugged right into his amps and wasn't using like any kind of pedals or anything like that which I appreciate I mean whatever sound he got on his rhythm guitars too on this album was like tremendous yeah it sounds great
So when my sister in law got married. <laughs> Is this got... going where I think it's going? <laughs> I don't know where you think it's going. <laughs> we um we we're at the wedding and yeah. everyone's on the dance floor having a great time. <laughs> and the DJ puts this song on. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> cleared the dance floor. No. Oh. Every... Cause, well, it's not really how do you, it's not really a dance song, you know what I mean? Like I don't know. I thought that you were gonna say like this was like this was like their first dance song. Or no, no, <laughs> far from it. Like the, it just clear like no one knew what to do. They just everyone just left the dance floor and like it was little, probably like I don't know two minutes into the song they just killed it and went on to something else. Oh man! <laughs> they realized they had made a a big mistake. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I guess you can't really can't really do anything to this song i mean the beginning you could probably slow dance to it a little bit but i mean that's yeah like you, yeah, that's the thing i think it starts off as kind of like a slow dance song and then it's like what are we supposed to do to this rock part it's like a you can't like dance to a rock song like that you know yeah it's, not... it's just just like sebastian maniscalco i can't dance the white snake <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> i remember when i saw that bit i was like that cross thought about my sister-in-law wedding i can't do it I can't dance to White Snake. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally true. Mm. Um, well, I mean, maybe, um, maybe as this love, you could dance to. Yeah, like that's. I think you could like slow dance to the whole song, but this one's like slow dance. Now, what are we supposed to do? Boogie, <laughs> do the monkey. Do the monkey. What are you supposed to do? Oh shit! Uh, so, what do you think of Here I Go Again? Hmm. Um, I'll give this one a, I'll give this one a four. Um, I really like it. Um, there are, there are like, I, I definitely think this is the definitive version. I think the, the changing of the, the changing of the lyrics, um, that, that one lyric in there definitely helps it. I think it's definitely a more loose, a heavier version than the original. Um, I kind of miss the original solo though. There, there are a couple of yeah. there are a couple of songs. This one and when they uh, when he did uh, "Fool for Your Lovin'" on um, "Slip of the Tongue," um, even though I like Steve Vai's solo on that, and I do like the solo on this one. I mean, it's you know it's classic going to this version. Um, I believe the original "Here I Go Again" had like that kind of um, was it a was it like a harmony a harmony solo or something? It was like a dual guitar or something like yeah. that? Or yeah, yeah. Um, and I can't remember if it was Moody or Marsden, but it was really like it's really one of the things that I liked about the original version. Like sometimes I'll hear the two different versions of the white snake songs. And I'll imagine to myself, like, Oh, if the, if it were like the 87 version, but it had like the, the 82 solo in it, then it would, or, you know, it would be so awesome, but it's we need um, to make like a Franken, a Frankenstein version of the song. <laughs> yeah. Or it's like, Oh, or if it like his vocals in this verse were in that version, then it, you know, like you, yeah, you kind of like Frankenstein it together, but, um, but overall, you could, I think you could play the 87 version. And then every time he says hobo, just, just super impo- drifter over like-, <laughs> <laughs> like that, like drifter. <laughs> all muffled and off time. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, uh, I think this is, uh, this is the, this is the classic. This is the definitive. This is the hit version. Um, I think it's, um, I think it's great. I don't, um, I mean, it's definitely poppy. It's definitely made for radio. It's made for, uh, uh, for, for that kind of thing. Um, I don't want to say that's what's stopping me from giving it a five. It's just kind of like, it doesn't, um, I guess it doesn't pump me up as much as some of the, um, uh, kind of more uh, dynamic or heavier, fast paced, um, songs that we've heard so far. Um, but this one is still definitely like great like so far side one's been a hit um david coverdells and have anything to say about this in the metal hammer um article that i've been quoting from because mm. this wasn't included in the uk version uh, and it's probably done like pre-release mm-hmm. um so you know what i'm just i'm gonna give this one a five. Oh, you know like I, I, if you had told me 10 years ago you're gonna do a deep purple ratings podcast and give the 87 version a five i would have laughed at you but hmm. there's something about it that i've grown this appreciation for and when i hear it every so often on the radio um i just out of something about it, that that opening with the piano which normally those tones would throw me off but it's like him singing alone with that piano opening and that pad in the background it reminds me of like time and again or like which i was like one of my 
probably my all time favorite Coverdale, well, one of my all time favorite Coverdale songs. Um, and it just like something about it just really gets me. And, and hearing his vocal delivery in the context of all the stuff we've spoken about just to me is, is just great. And I, I would have get, I would have bet a million dollars. I preferred the 82 version, but, um, you know, actually doing this, I think I prefer the 87 version. Mm -hmm. Apologies that's... to some people. I know that's going to upset. Oh boy. Um, oh but... boy. Oh brother. Oh but boy. It's, it's uh, it, I don't know. It, I mean, it's it, and it's at any rate, you know, you can agree with it or not agree with it, but you can't argue with the success that this track achieved for the band. And, right. You know, any any um, even if David Coverdale was a one hit wonder and this was the only song he ever released, he could still you know, afford to just be in a, living in the lap of luxury and retired off of it for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. um, so good for him. We should all be so lucky to have that one song. I'm still looking for mine. Um, okay. So that's, uh, that's side one. That's, that's, that's where we, uh, where we end up here. Um, and I guess, uh, it's time to, uh, start wrapping things up. Um, but before we do, of course, we have to thank, our what are they called where are they Somewhere down here. <laughs> core oh, level they patrons our foundation level patrons. i mean fund oh jesus how did i mess that one up foundation all right we're gonna foundation. Have to episode over <sighs> um okay if i can get ready here um so yes uh so appreciating all of those great patrons the people who keep this show running as you know we're 100 percent listener supported and we thank you all so coming in at the three pound aromatic feed tier we have simon ford at the $3.33 halfway to evil tier, Raf Calf, Spike the Rock Cat, and Spike's Mom. At the $3 Nobody's Perfect tier, we have Peter Gardo, <laughs> Ian DeRosier, Mark Roback, Duncan Leesk, Stuart McCord, Flight of the Rat Bat Blue Light, Ivan Fieldboo. It's a great Siemensen. JJ Stenard and Ruinous Inadequacies. Coming in at the $1.71 I Want My Own tier tier, we have Rich Yingwe Shaylo. At the 10 kroner tier, Karsten Lau. At the one pound tier, Paul! And at the $1 made-up name tier, we have The Leaking in the Rain, Leaky Mausoleum, Stephen Somerville, the Concerto 1999 Fanatic, Hank the Tank, Private Eyes, Ashen Lionel. Oh. <laughs> Oops. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Blackmore tights. And the coughing version. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, John Maselli. Yeah, but but one wow does so not mend a broken heart. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know what any of what this guy says means? No, we don't. It's funny. I got a um, I got a um, email from John Maselli uh, just yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was just, uh, just telling me some artists to check out. And then he said, um, also, when you play the Tony Danza clip at the end, <laughs> end of every show, I crack up every time. So I'm glad <laughs> that John has uh, got a good sense of humor about it. You're not the only one, my friend. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Um, well, well, I guess with that, it's about time to uh, to wrap things up. Can you, can you believe it? <laughs> I'm glad, you know, we were debating like, do we do this in one episode? I really don't know if we could probably do it in one episode easily. And now I'm looking at the time and I'm like, no, nope, it was a good idea to make this two, uh, two episodes. <laughs> Didn't you learn anything from Coverdale Page? I know. <laughs> well, this is much shorter in, in terms of how many songs are on it, but I think there's just so much to say about every song and about the history. Yeah. And everything. I think yeah. This, it... Yeah. The, and there's a lot of stuff that I know on the next episode post post album i don't know what you have uh in store in term in terms of like um reviews and clippings and stuff but other stuff that i would i have questions about 
there is so much stuff I have, in fact, that I was actually going to I was going to loop some of it into this episode. But given how long it went, I don't think we can. <laughs> Yikes. Hmm. So I'm like, I don't want. So maybe next the next episode might be three hours. Who knows? Um, oh, boy. For everyone's sake. But anyway. I guess that's all I got. Anything else before we wrap up? No, just tune in next week to see what these two knuckleheads have to say about White Snake eighty seven side two. Tune in, tune in next week for the stunning conclusion. How will we rank the remaining five songs? It's anyone's guess, really, including ours, because like that's the interesting thing is I just I'm looking at our rankings like I had no idea going into this. Bef- I don't think about it until we until we're right here, and then I'm just like, wow, I'm giving this one a four. I'm giving this one a five. Who knows? Oh, I, well, I think that's what makes the the ratings most honest. Yeah, we. Um, I don't. I don't. Um, I don't meditate on them beforehand. Nope, not at all. We don't do anything that requires any work beforehand. So, except you. Except well, sometimes sometimes <laughs> you have to do. You have to have uh, everything ready to record. But oh all right, yeah, John. All right, well, I will see you next week, my friend. Okay. Later. Thank you for listening to the Deep Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear and would like more episodes in the future, please donate on Patreon to support the show. You can also leave us a review in Apple Podcasts to help new people discover the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for show updates. See deeppurplepodcast.com for more details. Thank you for listening.